Good day, good people. This is Mr. Burley with Mr. Burley Teaches, mini lectures for the AP Environmental Science Classroom. Today we're smack dab in the middle of a pollution unit, and I'd like to go over a little bit about oil and oil spills. A little bit about oil and how oil is created. We have to remember that oil is hydrocarbons, so we're talking about dead plants and animals, in particular marine organisms, as they die and fall out of the ocean water, they will accumulate on the bottom of the ocean in basically layers and then geology and time will squeeze those layers and bury them and turn those marine organisms into what we're going to later call an oil deposit which is basically a deposit of hydrocarbons and then when we burn those hydrocarbons we're going to break that bond and hydrogen is released and carbon is released in the form of CO2 because it reacts with oxygen very quickly and that's what makes a hydrocarbon a hydrocarbon. All right? It's dead organisms that ha are carbon based get buried under geologic time and pressure they'll be converted into some type of material in this case liquid oil and when we drill it up process it and burn it we break that hydrogen carbon bond and carbon dioxide is released and that that's what it means to be a fossil fuel when those deposits geologically form, you have to remember everything forms on a horizontal level at first. All right, so let's say we have a layer of what, we, what we're later going to call oil. Um, geology and time are going to create that oil. But very rarely is anything linear. So geology will also crush and smash and bend and fold rock. And what happens is the oil will basically float up and be trapped in these folds where there's impermeable rock boundaries. And if you notice here, oil and gas form together, so you'll always have gas, which is lighter, on the top, and then there's the oil inside there. But these deposits are what geologists have to go around and find. And oil companies will pay them to drill down and drill test wells. Sometimes they miss, sometimes they hit. And the more you hit, the less money you cost your company. So those are the good geologists. Um, if you miss too often, you might be fired. However, a geologist has to try to understand the subsurface geology and where these oil deposits are. So when they drill, we can literally just pump and extract that oil out. All right, and sometimes they're offshore. So if we look at our offshore rig here, um, we've discovered oil. So we're just going to float an offshore rig here and drill down underground and access that oil deposit and just begin pumping. All right, now, the key here with our oil spills are if or when you're pumping that oil onto a rig, we have to transport that oil uh, back to land, to a refinery. Very rarely, if ever, there are refineries very close to where the oil is found. Uh, Texas might be the only case where the refineries are in the same state as the oil extraction. However, where you find the oil, you have to now transport it to a refinery to be made into the products that you and I use. Uh, we're talking about kerosene, gasoline, home heating, oil, asphalt, rocket fuel, plastics, anything that's petroleum-based um, needs to be refined from the crude oil that's underground. When you find oil, we call it crude oil. It's not ready to go. We can't put it in our gas tanks or our oil uh, furnaces and and use it we have to then refine and process uh, the crude oil into the products that you and I both know so crude oil comes in two forms there's light crude and heavy crude heavy crude is very sticky very gooey crude oil has high viscosity and if you remember viscosity is resistance to flow so it has high resistance to flow so this is very slow moving very thick very gooey all right, as a, and this is a, of lower quality, uh, is heavy crude. So it's going to take more refining. It's going to be a dirtier product uh, rather than light crude, which is a little bit more uh, viscous. I'm sorry, a little less viscous. It's more fluid. Uh, it's, it's lighter. It, it, is, it is what you're looking for. Light crude on Earth has become somewhat rare. There isn't too much on Earth uh, anymore. We are... Uh, mo we have moved into the realm of extracting more and more heavy crude, which is more costly, um, it's dirtier, but this is what we have left on Earth. The light crude deposits on Earth have been more or less exhausted. Um, and you'll learn when we get to our energy unit all about where we're getting our oil now. And the heavy crude that we are now processing is the dirtiest of the dirty, uh, the tar sands of Alberta, Canada. Nevertheless, um, when you pump oil out of the ground, 
Um, in this case, we're pumping it with these derricks. We get it out of the ground, and then we have to transport it from where we're extracting it to a refinery. Uh, and when you transport oil, it could be done in one of two ways. It could be done via pipeline, all right, and that's obviously over land, and it could be done uh, via ship. So that's how oil is transported, and in both cases, you can have accidents. The ships that ship crude oil around the world to the different refineries are some of the largest ships in the world, and they're out every day, all day, uh, taking crude oil back and forth from um, areas of extraction to refineries. And this particular boat here is the Nock Nevis. If you look up here, there's a five-story building which houses the cruise quarters, the cafeterias, um, all the offices. Uh, there's a five-story building on this ship that is dwarfed by the actual size of this ship. So here's an oil refinery uh, we're coming out of air pollution unit. This industry is one of the worst in regards to air pollution. Lots of carcinogens coming out of the smokestacks. Um, very, very dirty industrial operations. Um, if there is an oil refinery, there is cancer. Corpus Christi, Texas is one of the most famous examples because the refinery is there and the town has some of the highest rates of cancer in the country. But that's a byproduct of having an oil refinery in your town. My point is here, we have to transport the oil and en route to these refineries is where spills and things can happen. All right, we're going to look at Alaska to start here. And I want to bring you up here to Bruf Beaufort Bay and Pruder Bay. Um, and then later, we're going to talk about Anwar, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, in a different lecture, way up here in the northeastern corner of Alaska. However, there's a lot of oil up here in northern Alaska, uh, but there's no oil refineries. The oil refineries are in Texas, California, and so forth. So there's literally a pipeline built from northern Alaska all the way down through the whole entire state of Alaska down to Valdez, Alaska, where ships are then going to take it out from that port to the refineries. So they built a pipeline called the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline, um, which is about 700 miles all the way across the state of Alaska. That would be about from here to Florida, all right, just to give you a little bit of scale there. And here's the town of Valdez. All right, the city of Valdez is down here at the southern end of Alaska, and this is the port. So Prince William Sound becomes the place that these gigantic ships have to navigate uh, very carefully to first pick up the crude oil and then to leave and take it toward the refineries. So here's how this works. These big giant ships, remember, have to navigate these very tiny little straits and peninsulas and islands and get in here to the port of Valdez. They'll pick up millions of gallons of oil and then just like the roads that we drive on they have to stay to the right and they're gonna take them out to port I'm sorry take them out on the ocean um, to the refineries. On March 24, 1989 the Exxon Valdez ship was leaving the port and unfortunately um, a bit of human error caused the ship to go off course cross the wrong side of the road and smash into one of these little islands and the rocks cut open the side of the ship spilling 11 million gallons of crude oil into Prince William Sound alright so the first the sheen went out that rainbow pattern that you'll see very characteristic of an oil spill and the slick covered all the land area on the coastlines of Prince William Sound. So all these tiny little uh, shorelines on these islands, very sensitive habitat in a lot of these cases. Um, and you can even dig down into the sands of some of these islands and coastlines today and you'll see and find a small thin layer of oil still there. At the time, the Exxon Valdez spill was the worst spill in United States history. That has now been surpassed by uh, the spill we're going to talk about next. But a lot was learned about this spill. A lot was learned about how to contain the oil. Uh, we made some changes with the boats. All right, here is the Exxon Valdez uh, spilling the oil into the Prince William Sound. Um, since then, we learned a lot about it. And instead of a, a single hull ship where if there's a tear here, all the oil is going to come pouring out. Um, they actually now make a double hauled tanker so there's a space between the wall of the ship there's a space in there so if there's a rip in the in the side of the 
the tanker, it'll take in water. However, it's going to take it into this little area. Uh, they can come over and seal it off. Uh, the point being here, no oil will spill out. There's a protective area in there, like a buffer zone. Uh, they call that the double-hulled tanker. So that's one thing that we learned from this situation, from this disaster. But we also learned a lot about how to contain the oil once it does get out into the ocean. That's what we could talk about now. What we want to do is protect sensitive coastlines. A lot of these coastlines have some of the most valuable ecosystems in our country, particularly our mangrove forests, our sensitive wetlands. Endangered species call these places home, not to mention the marine and aquatic ecosystems that a lot of people depend on for their livelihoods. We're talking about the shrimp industry, uh, the tuna industry, scallops and things like that. So we want to protect the coastlines and this oil slick here looks to be interacting with a sensitive ecosystem where a river meets the ocean in this delta here in Louisiana. The organisms will suffer, all right? so it's a race against time to get out there and clean the animals that you can catch. Uh, the ones that you can catch are usually the ones that are so caked with oil that they can't fly and they can't run away. So those are the ones that you're going to get out to as a volunteer uh, to help. And you want to package them up and get them to a rehabilitation center so that you don't spend an hour on the beach cleaning them and then they run over and get recontaminated. We're going to take them to a safe location where we can clean and process them and then re-release them out into a, uh, an ecosystem later. Um, but, you know, I've never been on a clean cleanup event, but I can only imagine what it must feel like to be holding an animal particularly a pelican or a whooping crane, something that's sensitive, or this turtle here, and you feel its little heart pounding in its chest because it knows it's in trouble. The feathers, once they have oil on them, have lost their ability to protect the skin of the animal, so the animal literally begins to be poisoned by the, the oil. It might lick itself and ingest the oil that way. Um, it's a race against time to get these organisms uh, to, to a place where you can clean them. All right, which leads us to the largest oil disaster in United States history, the BP oil spill. The Exxon Valdez was a disaster at 11 million gallons. The BP oil spill was 210 million gallons, dwarfing the Exxon, the Exxon Valdez event. And it's very interesting what happened here. On April 20th, 2010, there was an explosion on an offshore oil rig. 11 people were killed instantly. Um, the problem was that for months, if not years, uh, this rig was being fined for safety infractions. And they kept telling them that something's going to happen someday, and in this case it did. The explosion severed the pipe that connected the offshore oil rig to an underground oil deposit. And if you look here, here's our rig right here that's floating, actively pumping oil from a very deep oil deposit and the depth of the of the pipe to the seafloor was one mile and if you look here from the seafloor to the oil deposit itself was another three three plus miles so we're talking about four miles underground was the oil deposit so when this explosion occurred the pipe broke but it broke under the water so literally in this case for four months and four weeks and two days so we're talking almost five months. Oil was spewing from a broken pipe a mile under the water in the Gulf of Mexico. This is a place where you cannot get humans. We had to get submersibles down there. And it was very difficult. If you look at this picture in the lower right, that's the pipe that was look, looked like that for four months and four weeks, spewing oil into the Gulf of Mexico. Submersibles were unsuccessful in closing this pipe. They tried to explode it shut. They tried to shove tennis balls down there. They tried for four months and four weeks and two days to close that broken pipe. All the while, it was spewing millions of gallons into the Gulf of Mexico. The way they fixed it is unbelievable, in, in my opinion. They built a rig close by. They drilled down the three and a half to four miles, and then they drilled horizontally to find and access the original pipe underground. In my opinion, that is like putting a man on the moon to figure that out and find that pipe. And then what they were able to do was divert the flow of oil from the original pipe over to this new rig and then seal and cap and be done with it. And then they sealed and capped the old one. 
an unbelievable fix to an unbelievable disaster. You will hear that the original rig was called the Deepwater Horizon, and it goes down as a disaster of the same name, the Deepwater Horizon. All right, but what we can do is now we can finish up by discussing the things we learned and the methods we took to try and prevent some of the oil from spreading, clean it up, and um, do what we can about the spread of oil in this case. And we're going to have six things that we can do. We can title this note, Oil Containment and Cleanup Methods and Techniques. And the first one is a containment boom. And what the containment booms do, um, they're basically a flotation device to prevent the spread of the slick from reaching sensitive wetlands. So if you look back here, this is, looks like a mangrove swamp, and the pelicans are calling that home and their breeding area. So this is a very sensitive ecosystem. Um, mangrove swamps are great for holding down soil. They're a buffer zone for storm surges, things like hurricanes. Uh, they're very sensitive ecosystems, and they provide a tremendous amount of ecological services. So this containment boom uh, is, is deployed in the water, so they'll set it up, and what happens is underneath here, there might be some weights that hold this thing in place, and the oil slick will literally just hit the boom, and it could some of the booms absorb it, but most importantly, it stops it from spreading into that sensitive ecosystem. All right, so the booms are going to catch it, and in, in many cases absorb it, like I said, um, but it's the skimmer ships that will then come by and uh, collect that oil and then ship it away to treat as hazardous waste. Okay, so they're going to go around and then suck up the water and the oil to be then disposed of. In this picture, the dark blue areas are actually the cleaned water. All right, so you can see there's a bit of clean water. And then the, the browner, tanner areas are, are the oil. So this is all getting sucked in, in here um, into this skimmer ship to be taken off and, and uh, disposed of. So unfortunately, the booms here um, weren't deployed quick enough and the oil had gotten into this into this wetland. Um, but that's what the skimmer ships are. All right, number three, method or technique of cleaning or containing oil are controlled burns. All right, this was used a lot with the BP oil spill of 2010. Um, it's a quick and easy way to get rid of oil that's floating on the surface. The only thing about this is that it takes the oil from the water and puts it in the atmosphere. You know, burning hydrocarbons adds CO2 to the atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas, contributes to climate change. Um, some people say, well, we were going to burn the oil in some way anyway. But nevertheless, it goes up in black smoke in a controlled burn. It, in my opinion, it gets rid of it from the marine ecosystem and puts it into the atmosphere. Um, it, it's really good for public relations because one day the oil is there and a few days later uh, it, it has magically disappeared. So this was very effective. Um, it, it, it keeps it from hitting the sensitive ecosystems of the coastlines. Uh, you, you could be your own judge and jury about uh, controlled burns. Once the oil is in the water or on the shoreline, we could use bioremediation. You should remember a little bit about this. This is using organisms to reduce the size and impact of the pollution or the contaminant. So once the oil is a certain size, bacteria can then attack it. You could think of them as eating it because this is a hydrocarbon. That's something that they're going to call food. And they will literally eat the oil and reduce the size of it continue to eat and then out the other end uh, the byproduct would be water and carbon all right those are the things that have come out so they're taking the oil and making it less hazardous and reducing the size in the meantime all right this is a great way to clean up once the spill has been uh, dispersed a while or hit the beach and now it's uh, in the sands let's say um, you could also do this in the water as well but this is a growing field of science trying to figure out which bacteria work best, which ones work fastest, which ones are most effective. Um, a lot of research going on right now about uh, organisms in spill remediation. All right, number five is a chemical dispersant. 
All right, you're going to fly a plane over an area and spray this chemical across the water surface, which contains the oil. Remember, oil floats. It's less dense than water. So on the surface, that slick will go out. You can spray the chemical dispersant on it. Um, and what that's going to do is it's going to take tiny little bits of oil and make them start clumping together. So you have tiny little bits floating on the surface. But once you have the chemical dispersant, they're going to get bigger and bigger until they get so big that they're going to settle down into into the ocean onto the bottom of the ocean so these are highly controversial because it doesn't really clean up anything it just puts the problem somewhere else uh, and that somewhere else is going to be the bottom of the marine ecosystem so fishermen and you know people who there's livelihoods rely on the oyster population you know they're literally polluting the bottom of the ocean instead of the top now so this becomes very controversial because of that reason and also because we're not really sure what the chemicals are All right, they call them trade secrets um, the companies uh, uh, claim proprietary rights so what that means is they don't have to tell you what the chemicals actually are in the dispersant they claim that you might be able to tra uh, steal their recipe and start a company and make that chemical and sell it and, and, uh, and be a competitor. So they're not going to release the chemical because, you know, it would be like um, Coca-Cola releasing their recipe and somebody else can make Coca-Cola and sell it under a different name. Um, we do know that fishermen who have donated their boats to the cleanup effort have reported the chemical dispersant literally eating the hull of their boat and, and damaging the boat to the point that they can't use it. So what they do is they claim uh, they claim damages to BP and they wait until BP pays them back. However, you know they donated their materials and their boat in this case and now they're out of a job and they're out of their materials um, they're, they're in, a, in, a, in a tough place so the dispersant is effective uh, particularly for public relations because the oil slick is not visible on the surface anymore to the public it, it has sunk to the bottom um, in the form of oil clumps alright and then the last thing you can do is physical cleanup all right, and this is going out on the beach as a volunteer and with your kitty litter scooper or your mop made of human hair or your toothbrushes or any rags and materials they give you and going out on the beach and physically cleaning this up. Um, a very sad, last resort, um, tedious way to do it. Um, however, it's necessary. Once the oil reaches the beaches, it's going to take people to physically remove it, pick up the clumps, and dispose of it um, all along the way saving as many animals and organisms as you can okay so that's a little bit about uh, two case studies the Exxon Valdez case study and here you go with the Deepwater Horizon and the BP oil disaster of 2010 which goes down as the worst oil spill in United States history uh, and just to finish up here BP did pay a record $4.5 million in damages, and they were banned for four years from receiving government contracts of offshore oil drilling. And they pled guilty to 11 counts of manslaughter for the 11 people who were killed, and two misdemeanors and one count of lying to Congress about uh, what was going on and the safety violations. What we need to do, in my opinion, uh, because we do need oil, we are a world that is reliant upon this as a fuel source and a convenience to the products that we all use and enjoy. Um, if we are going to consider offshore oil drilling, uh, we need to be very careful. We need to learn from our mistakes and the disasters that our world has suffered. And we need to properly regulate and have laws in place so that to prevent future disasters. We're living in an interesting time. Um, they are talking about opening up more and more sh offshore areas, including off the shore of New Jersey. Uh, they're opening up off the coast of Alaska. They're talking about exploratory drilling off the coast of California. Um, so <laughs> if we're going to use this and continue to use this method of offshore drilling, in my opinion, we just need to learn and not waste the disasters as learning opportunities. Hopefully this uh, mini lecture has opened your eyes a little bit 
to uh, the problems associated with offshore drilling, the two case studies that we looked at. And, you know, if you do spill something, uh, the methods and the techniques to clean it up. Um, bring any questions to class that you might have. And thanks for listening.